Are you talking shift? We are. It's time for the We're Talking Shift podcast. Now, now, now. Here to talk shift, Lori Bischoff. We're talking shift. Hey, everyone. I'm Lori Bischoff. Welcome to We're Talking Shift, the podcast where my guest and I talk shift because the antidote to feeling stuck begins in our minds with a shift in our thinking. And that shift often means that you've got to take some action and every now and then, you just got to go rogue, which is what my guest did at some point in their lives. They made a radical shift that altered the course of their life. So talking about the importance of shifting is what I'm passionate about sharing with you in the hopes that you too will be inspired to go rogue if you need to make some shifts happen in your own life. Today, you guys, I have the pleasure of talking with Buck Grant, who was actually on the show earlier this year in mid-January, but he has a new book out now that I'm very excited to talk to you about. Buck is a lifelong martial artist and a personal development coach. He's the author of a book called Over the Top Rope, Life Lessons from the Ring, which is an autobiographical account of his fight career and the life lessons that he learned. Buck also founded the Muay Thai University, which is a leadership and coach development program through the art of Muay Thai kickboxing. But his new book, which is called The Warrior Code for Men, A 28 Guide to a Hero's Mindset, is what we're going to be diving into today. Hello again, Buck. Welcome back to We're Talking Shift. I'm so happy to have you back on. Oh, it was a pleasure to be back on the show. Looking forward to it. I am too. I am very excited to talk about your new book. So let's just jump into it. Um, The Warrior Code for Men, a 28-day guide to a hero's mindset. I love that. So, Buck, why why this book um, and why now? So um, I've been doing personal development coaching and martial arts coaching through... Uh, martial arts yoga coaching for over 20 years and the the idea of coaching other men was something that kept on popping up I, i've coached people from all over but it seemed to be that there was like a need for it a need of need for some type of male guidance and it was actually a, a field that i i steered away from mostly because I, I i saw a lot of what was going on in the world with um personal development coaches and uh, men coaching other men and seeking, seeking uh, other men's guidance. And there seemed to be this place of marketing is important and we all understand that, but the coaches seem to be coming from this marketing place of life. You know, you are not enough, you are not worthy, but we can make you worthy. You are not whole enough as you are. And I wanted to come from a completely different place, a little bit more of a, a practical philosophical aspect where people could not only learn where their, their pitfalls, their, 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 their dark spots in their mind, the places that they can't see, um, shed some light on it and then give them some practical tools so that they can ultimately um, have their own freedom. We ended up changing the name of the book right before public publishing, um, the warrior code for men. And we changed it to a 28 day guide to personal freedom. And we changed it, for that exact reason. I, as a coach, do not want, I've always told people like as a coach, I want to make myself obsolete. Um, yeah. I want to give, give people enough tools so that they can go find freedom on their own rather than having to rely on me as a, as a crutch. Yes. So we change it to personal freedom because I want people to have the tools necessary so that they can go find freedom for themselves. And that's why the book was written. I love it. You know, there was um, there was something that you stated right early on. I think it's page three. I'm going to pull it up here. <clears throat> you made the statement that goes like this. I began to notice a trend in the world. Masculinity had become the new curse word in the modern era. And terms like toxic masculinity became common language because of negative negative, prominent social and political figures. Men found themselves confused and without guidance on how to show up in the world. And um, you went on to say guidance was needed and very little uh, was to be found. So you decided to write this book to address that dilemma. And I really like what you said there because 
I, I really agree with that. I feel like, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bad people out there and, um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be balanced, but I, I'm also acutely aware of this whole, uh, it's not quite man bashing, but there's a lot of that going on. And so, (laughs) so, you know, I don't want to like, you know, get, get too far off track here, but, but that just really caught my eye because, you know, I think, um, there's some representatives of, of all kinds of different, um, you know, cultures and, you know, men and women and, you know, everything out there. And it's like, sometimes the few bad apples give the whole, you know, community a bad rap. And I feel like that's what's happened a lot with men lately. And, you know, being that I have a son and I have, um, who's amazing. And I have a husband who's amazing. I have, uncles and cousins, you know, male cousins, and they're all amazing men. And so I, I feel like, yeah, they need, there needs to be somebody out there sticking up for the good guys too, <laughs> you know, cause there's a lot of good guys out there. There are. And you know, the, the nature of, of uh, this goes back to the marketing conversation I was having before the nature of marketing is polarization. Um, yeah. you know, it, if we can find a bad guy and make you the viewer inherently the good guy and create some separatism between you and another group of people, then that's where you get, um, that's basically where you get the news. That's why I don't watch the news. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I I see, first of all, I think that more of it than not is, is false news appearing to be real Mm -hmm. that, I don't necessarily think that as a whole, everyone thinks that all men are, are bad and that no. masculinity as a whole is bad. But there needs to be a certain sense of, of balance because I, I'm, I'm seeing men in this world that are very, very, they're very confused. They don't know whether on one hand they're told that they should be softer, that they should have more feminine qualities. And so human beings being these tribal creatures that seek the comfort of other animals and their species, particularly if you are a straight man, for example, the need and um, acceptance of another woman, then you will do anything and everything to feel accepted if you don't have a true sense of your own self. So we've got men being very, very feminine and to make other women like them to become a part of that group. And then at the same time, the same women that want to have a certain type of man in their life are asking for things like, I want you to be stronger. I make you to be more assertive. I want you to be, um, to stand up to quote unquote man up. And yeah. so men are stuck with this polarity of like, which one am I supposed to be in order to be accepted in the world? And the real problem is people seeking acceptance outside of themselves. Right. And oh, that's yeah. where the main issue is. So, and that's where the book kind of came from. It's where it was spawned from. That's awesome. I think, uh, the timing is ripe. So I'm, I'm really glad that you wrote this book. Um, so, um, you, you say in there that, you know, the book is designed to help men find the clarity that they need to define purpose, you know, and it's using the warrior archetype as a guide. So speak about that a little bit. So I, I, I came from a martial arts background. Um, and I found that like in a certain state of, of, of mind, if you are in control of your faculties, then there's essentially two types of archetypes that, um, that take over. Um, this is if you're not hijacked by your limbic brain and you're working off of fight or flight uh, response, Mm -hmm. people tend to take on two types of archetypes. I borrowed this from this language from, from other teachers. Um, but it it seems to resonate true. You have the yogic philosophy and you have the warrior, which in my mind are are the two sides of the same coin. And though the yogi is the person who accepts things as they are, things that cannot be changed, um, you accept them as you are. That gives you a certain sense of peace. And then the warrior is the person who fights for a cause. It's not just a fighter. I, I came up as a fighter in a ring where essentially it was all about me. It was all about me winning winning five minutes at a time, 25 minutes at a time. But a warrior is a person that literally fights for a cause. Hence, if you look at a war, a war is not a haphazard um, battle. A war is, is two or more forces 
fighting for some sense of a purpose or a cause that is what they're willing to die for. Um, and so what we're looking at right now is like a warrior archetype is the archetype that has decided this is what I'm willing to fight for, whether that be a mental, emotional, or physical battle. And because I'm coming from a clear space of like understanding what I fight for, then I fight with a certain sense of freedom and fight, meaning I use a, a sense of like energy or effort to influence my will upon something in order to make it happen i.e. change the character that I am now into a character that I would like to be. And okay. that's why we use the warrior archetype. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're not fighting just for the sake of fighting. You're, you're choosing what you're fighting for. Yes. And, and quite often, um, even from my own personal experience, I found myself thinking that I was fighting for my own cause. But the reality is once I started doing a lot more self-study, I was disguising what I thought was my own cause to hide some inner insecurities of me looking for acceptance, either from an absent father or a woman in my life that I wanted to, that I adored or business partners that came up as uh, father figures in my life. So I found myself fighting really, really hard, but I was fighting for the wrong things. And so when I was able to, decide what was really, really important to me, then oddly enough, what ended up happening, and this is kind of the paradox of a warrior, what ends up happening is you end up fighting less because you realize that who you are is in essence something that doesn't need to be defended so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. It never needs to be defended. It never needs to be explained. And then you're used, simply using your efforting and will to be guided in a, in, in a path that is more conducive to who you are as a person. And that's where the fight comes from. I think that sometimes when people look at a, the thing warrior, it, warrior can be very convoluted, can be very loaded in a sense where, okay, if you were a soldier, you were a warrior. And if you fought in a ring, then perhaps you're a warrior. And people use war, things like warrior two and yoga to like embody a yoga spirit, but no one really understands what it means to be one. And in my opinion, a warrior is a person who has found a cause that is worth using my effort and will to fight for. Um, and that also uses discernment to decide what things are just no longer useful to fight for in the first place. Yeah. I, and I think that that's really key too, is the discernment and um, diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Diplomacy, so, that's huge. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, those are, those are I, I think, everything you just said and then those two things really seem to me to be like the, that's what the embodiment of a true warrior in the sense that you're speaking of. That's how you would mm -hmm. show up, right? Yes. The people that I, have, I admire the most were, the, the warriors that I admire the most were the most calm, most peaceful people because they felt no need to continuously defend themselves against things they needed not to defend themselves against. They stepped yes. into the world with a sense of understanding themselves and therefore they were calm and at peace and only had to use a sense of force when it was absolutely necessary. And they knew where that line was because they did all the internal work to decide where their line was. Right. People who have not think that everything is something they need to fight. If you're a hammer, everything is a nail. And that's, yeah. that's the way it's been approached, right? Yeah. So. Great, great metaphor. I love that's exactly right. It's true, really. Uh, but you're right. It, it should be a last resort, not the knee jerk reaction to everything. Yes. And I mean, even fighting to a degree of like, when I say fight, I'm not even talking about a physical fight. I'm talking about, yeah. you know, if you are in a mental or an emotional battle with like your beloved one, are you actually fighting the right thing? Are you fighting? Are you fighting for the sake of protecting some sense of your your identity, or are you trying to insert some part of your will in order to make that relationship, for example, a better place? Are you trying to have a better relationship, or are you trying to just win because winning is all you have been taught to mm -hmm. seek for? Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of a, that's very very important. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, okay, I feel, uh, when I read, read through it, I felt that even though this book is really wrote it for men, but I think there's a lot of value in here for, for women too. So do you, do you think that, did you think that as you were writing it, that maybe, um, women would also benefit from reading this? Oh, absolutely. They won. <laughs> from, the, yeah. from the moment I started writing it, I, here's, 
the, the paradox of being a person in the kind of the, you know, you're trying to, I'm essentially helping people recognize that they, they can be free on their own. And in that paradox, you have the business marketing world where you have to appeal to a certain small group of people in order to make a name. So I understand, for example, that men experience the world in a very unique way compared to women. But at mm-hmm. the end of the day, all humans have the same human experience. We're all seeking love. We're trying to avoid pain. Um, we want to be accepted. We want to be appreciated. And it just manifests in a slightly different ways when it comes from man, woman, transgender, black, white, whatever you have it. Right. We're all speaking to the same root. We're all speaking to the same thing. So rather than going in and, and writing a bunch of stuff that is only pertinent to like one group of people, even though it's addressed to men, mm-hmm. all the stuff in this book pertains to everybody and anybody. I could have changed the book to the warrior code for women and, and I wouldn't have changed the word except for a couple of words that said man instead of woman. That would have been right. It. right. And that was done on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I know. I think that's, I think it's awesome. And not only, yeah, I agree. It, the lessons uh, can apply to anyone and everyone, but also if you're, if you're reading it, you know, f- from a woman's perspective, it it can also give you more uh, greater understanding and more insight into maybe the mentality of the masculine. Mm, agreed. It's um, empathy is one of the most powerful tools that we have as as human beings. Um, our ability to somewhat experience the emotion of other people and. I've encouraged many of my, my female friends to read the book because when they look at it and they, I found that a lot of people resonate with the stories, whether they're a man or a woman, and they start to realize like, oh man, we are all going through the same thing. You know, when my, when my husband is stressed out about work, it's not really work that he's stressed out. He's stressed out about being accepted, being loved is the primal part of his brain that thinks that if I don't do these things that are quote unquote masculine, that I'm going to be kicked out of my tribe. My, my wife's not going to love me. My kids aren't going to love me. And no one's going to su- appreciate and support me. And everyone can resonate with that. It just so mm-hmm. happens that it manifests a certain way when a man says it, but it's not different. We all are the same. And so that empathy of going through, oh, I know what they're going through. I experienced that myself. We can kind of go through this thing together instead of feeling like we're so separate. Yes. Well said. I remember... Um... Like I have a, a a quick little story that speaks to that. It was oh gosh, years ago, maybe maybe uh, twelve years ago or something, a dozen years ago. And um, we at that time we had a, a pet cat, and um, I was home. I was having a group of women over for a, kind of a group coaching type of thing, and my husband was out of town. And I had, so I had spent, of course, um, all of this time, you know, getting, getting my home ready and cleaning and prepping and, you know, all the things you're going to do when you're, when you're hosting a group in your home. And the cat had been sick at that time, um, for whatever reason. And so sure enough, right, uh, before my company was supposed to be knocking on the door, I, I go past the, the foyer and I see that my cat had been sick and left me some lovely stinky piles right on the mat in front oh. of the door. And I don't know if you've oh, ever, shit. you know, had a cat, but I'll tell you what, <laughs> what it's, it is, it, the, the, let's just say the fragrance is overwhelming. <laughs> oh, my it, it makes wow. doggy doo doo like walking through a bakery. So, so there's that. <laughs> So, so, you know, I just, I kind of roll my eyes. I looked at it sort of humorously, like, well, of course, you know, everything's perfect, but now there's this and I got to clean this up, you know, quickly. My husband calls right after I clean it up and he's like, you know, what's up, what's going on. And I share this with him. I'm kind of chuckling because I'm just looking at this, like, I'm not going to be mad. I mean, I'm just going to clean it up and get ready to, you know, get ready. Uh, Mm -hmm. I was actually amused, but I'm sharing this with him. And he got really short with me and basically said, you know, I don't remember now exactly what he said, but he got really short with me and was kind of cold and basically hung up the phone. And I remember hanging up the phone going, 
I seriously said to my, I said out loud to, to my, me and the cat, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh like, my God. <laughs> I was like, what, what happened there? Why was he so rude? And, you know, and I was like, nah, you know what? I'm not, I'm, I've got people showing up like any second now and I'm not going to let this, you know, mess with my, my headspace. You know, I was in a good mm -hmm. mood and I could not figure this out. So Fast forward to um, literally just a few minutes later, um, right before the first knocks on the door, and he calls me back and he goes, I'm sorry, um, I didn't mean to be rude. I just, I'm not there to help you with this. And he didn't know how to, he was like, he felt bad. He felt like, he interpreted it as like a complaint maybe, and it was something he mm. needed to fix and he couldn't fix it. So, mm. well, when he couldn't fix it, you know, he, he just reacted in that way, which, which I took, you know, as how rude and mean, but for him, it was just the reaction was, I can't fix this. I, you know, I should, how can I handle all of this? And I'm out of town. So it was just this bizarre, but it, it kind of speaks to, you know, the place that we are all coming from. And like you just said, you know, for, for so much of the, um, the male mentality. And when you're in partnership with, with a man, um, it, it's like, you know, that's a lot of their identity is I need to, I need to take care of things. I need to fix things when they need fixing. And when they can't do that, um, you know, frequently, uh, it, it shows up in weird ways and their frustration comes out in ways that, you know, you're receiving in a way it's not intended. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, that is, that is the archetypical story of every man that I know, including myself. I, I struggle, I've struggled with it myself. Um, I see something and I want to fix it. And when I don't feel like I'm in um, a position to fix it, I feel that my, my own identity is questionable in it. And even though my partner won't even think twice about it, like yourself, that's not even something that even dawned on you, but to him, it was right. a big deal. And, and just even us being aware of each other's like internal stories, our internal di dialogue, that, that 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 goes on gives us a huge sense of, of, of empathy. And it maybe allows some space, like you allow some space for it, number one, because you had to move on to something else, but mm -hmm. allowing a little bit of space for him to like process and go, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm sorry. This is what this is what I was experiencing. Right. And, uh, and that's huge. That's yeah. Huge. So, so then the important part of that too, is we were able to, you know, to revisit it, circle back around. And I was able to say, you know, uh, let him know it, that that wasn't something that he needed to be concerned about. You know what? It's, it's, it's cat poop. I cleaned it up. <laughs> it, you asked me what I was doing. That's what I was doing. It wasn't a complaint. There's nothing I need you to fix. We're all good, honey. You know, and so we talk it out and it's all, and it's all good. But I was so glad that he called back and was able to say, here's why I came off that way so that I could have this understanding. And then I was like, oh, I get it. Because if we wouldn't have had that conversation, I would have gone on making up this story in my head, like, wow, he's really being a dick, you know? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. it, and it was, it was really the opposite. He was just so concerned and he couldn't fix it. He was being, you know, just, he was completely frustrated. So the communication yeah. is so key, but, yeah. but anyway, yeah. I, I want to talk about, um, some of the lessons you've got 28 days of lessons. So why 28 days? That's the form you've got the book laid out in. Well, perfectly honest with you, 28 days made more sense because it was like, okay, that's, that's, uh, that's four complete weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have, you know, it's four complete weeks. I could have said 30 days. I'm like, oh, well, that puts us two days over two complete weeks. Um, <laughs> I, it, it gave space for a volume two through eight if I wanted to do 365 days. But um, more importantly, I, I found that one of the best ways to like, really, really change your life is to have a complete and concise rehaul that, that's feasible, attainable, that's like palatable. Um, mm -hmm. If you tell somebody like, oh, I'm going to trans, you're going to transform your life in a year. A year is a really, really long time mm -hmm. to make a shift in your life. To say that like, if you commit every day for the next year, there are very few people on this planet that can just go from zero to 365 days and, and change their lives. But 28 days, 
of like, okay, you read something once every 28 days, you apply the lesson to it every 28 days. It's kind of like a jump start on your life. It gives you some new tools that you can, you can use right away. And they're things that are achievable for people. They're, they're, they're lessons. They're like, okay, if you think, and even if you just think in this way for the next 24 hours, it's going to change your perspective on the world. And it's something that you can attain right now. So that's where the 28 days started. It was, it was a, it was as a, a jump start to kind of get mm-hmm. people going in the right direction. It was something that was palatable. It's a, you know, quick read. I, I jokingly was talking to my wife about this, like, yeah, you know, this is kind of like one of those toilet reads, you know, you sit by your bathroom, <laughs> you know, I, I say that lovingly because some of the best books I've ever read were right by the toilet. You right. put it by the bathroom, you pick it up, you read it for a couple of minutes, read a chapter like, Oh, that that's really cool. I'm going to think about that all day today. And you put right. it out and then you pick it up the right. next day. And, you know, yeah, because you're, you're, you're kind of a captive right audience, right? <laughs> so. You pretty much, you know, guys on toilets. Yeah, <laughs> well, instead of a coffee table book, it's going to be the bathroom book. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Maybe I should have named it that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Maybe that's the right. next version. Yeah, next yeah. Version. So, okay, so to the 28 days, before we jump into some of your favorites, um, do they build on each other? You know, do you suggest that a person start at day one and then take it, you know, all the way through to 28? Or can a person skip around and just sort of randomly pick something? What do you suggest to get the most out of it? That's a good point. So all of them are designed where they can be picked up wherever you want. If you wanted to just flip the book open to like somewhere in the middle and read something, you will, you're, you'll, you'll be just fine. And I often do that with some of my, my favorite books. Um, a guy named Rolf Gates, who's a, yo- a, a yogi, who I admire quite a bit. He had a Meditations from the Mat book. It was 365 days. And basically, you could just pick it up any day of the, of the year and flip through it and get something out of it. There are a few chapters that like make references back to another chapter that mm-hmm. gives you a little bit more context. So in the end, if you do read it in order... You won't have to flip back and forth, but the chapters are purposely short so that if you're reading a chapter out of, you know, like you just flip to page you know, three, you know, 30 mm-hmm. and it says something like, oh, refer to chapter, blah, blah, blah. You can go back to that chapter, read it really quickly, and then you're caught up. You can right. pretty much pop it in any way that you want that feels good to you. Yeah. I like that too, yeah. because, uh, you know, a lot of people, um, I read a statistic, um, gosh, a few years ago, um, and I don't remember what the exact numbers was, but it was like something crazy, like 90% of people these days don't, don't read a book from cover to cover. They don't either read books at all, or they, or if they do pick up a book, they don't ever finish it. It never gets read from cover to cover. So I think writing your book with these awesome lessons in this manner so that if you are that person, you read it from front to back. Awesome. But if not, you can still get all of the great value out of it. If you are just somebody that wants to pick and choose, you know, here and there. Yeah. I mean, this is the average, average attention span now is about seven seconds wow. online, seven seconds and, you know, social media and phones and things of that nature pull our attention in a lot of different directions, which we talk about even in the book about how that, 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 of, that effect on you is essentially allowing your phone to think for you instead of you to think for yourself. And it's shortened our attention spans to the point where, you know, people don't, you're right, don't read books anymore. Um, mm-hmm. But if we're starting for, and I would love for people to have longer attention spans with some of the meditations and the, the group coaching and some of the retreats that are, the book is based on, um, will help people extend that attention span but you yeah. got to start where people are. So if people are starting in this place where I don't know where mm-hmm. to start a book that's, you know, 115 pages long and a chapter's two to three pages long. They get their attention right away. is a great start for them to get going. Yeah, definitely. Nice, nice, compelling, small bites. I like it. Yeah. I yeah. like it. So I had asked you, um, before if you had some favorites out of the 28 days of lessons and, uh, and you did give me, uh, some of your top faves. Um, so I wanted to ask you about a couple of those. So the first one you mentioned was day two, and that one is entitled beware of saber tooth tigers. So speak Mm -hmm. a little bit about that. What, why is this one one of your favorites? Oh, that's my favorite because one of my favorite things to do is tell stories. (laughs) 
<laughs> I, I feel like I'm a professional storyteller um, and we're all professional storytellers. We just tell our story um, mostly. So uh, the story I kind of share with people is like, it, it starts with this caveman Bob, a character I call caveman Bob. And, you know, caveman Bob lives in a caveman community, does caveman things. And all of a sudden one day caveman Bob gets eaten by a saber tooth tiger. And it goes into the tribe sitting around a, a, a fire, basically trying to discuss what are we going to do about this caveman Bob scenario? Like, we don't want to die like Bob died. So what are we going to do? And it shows these people telling stories about, um, okay, what's going to happen if we do this? What if we fight the tiger this way? What if we fight it that way? And some stories end in like we die. Other stories end in, oh, we live. But it played the point of like how the storytelling mind works. And it's our gift and our curses and, and humanity to be able to tell stories. We're the only creatures on planet Earth that can do that. The only right. creatures. And because we have this storytelling mind that is predisposed to keeping us safe, right? The idea that like the human brain is not really designed to make you happy. It's designed to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. It has this amazing capability to tell stories. And if you think about the power of a story, a story is literally me taking from the past, projecting into a future, a predictable or seemingly predictable outcome, mm -hmm. right? Like we can actually visualize like what is the future possibly going to look like based upon our past, yeah. what our brain tries to do really, really well. And it keeps us safe in environments where there might be, for example, a saber tooth tiger. The problem is most situations are not saber tooth tiger situations. Right. Most situations are not life or death, but our human brain has a hard time distinguishing between those two things. I think uh, there's a statistic that I learned in my yoga teacher training several years ago that um, the human mind only has to experience something that is three to 6% like a prior experience in order for it to react the exact same way. Mm-hmm. Three to six percent. So you, you know, get into a, you think that your father doesn't like you when you're a child. Some little thing happens. You don't think your father uh, is going to like you. And then 20 years later, you get in an argument with your wife and that that primal part of your brain goes back to that dangerous point. Of like, hey, remember that one time when that one person didn't like you, that person you called your father? Well, this person may not like you now and they might leave you. Mm -hmm. It only has to be that close in order for us to do that. So the story illustrated the power of the, of the storytelling mind. Mm -hmm. And then it also told the Achilles heel and also spoke to the point of like, why it's very, very important for us to at least understand the mind so that we can start to create some separation between us, the self and the mind, which is the tool that we can use. Otherwise, if we don't have separation, we think that we are the mind. And therefore, every story that we conjure inside of our head, we think could possibly be true right now. Right. So it's just kind of a, a fun way to kind of give people to, you know, stories have been the ways that we've learned how to, you know, there's basically the way that we have survived as a species. We're wired to listen to stories. We got, it goes to a primal part of our brain. It goes to that limbic part of our brain where we, instead of like, just gathering information, we feel the story, we feel caveman Bob dying by the saber tooth tiger. And mm -hmm. because we're feeling it, that, that feeling tone sticks with us and it in, inspires behavior because feeling inspires behavior. So it's good, but it's yeah. also something that we need to be able to monitor and be mindful of. And we're creatures that have that amazing capability to do that. So yeah. learning how to yeah. like master that skill is important. Yeah, no, I agree. Otherwise you're right. Otherwise you're, um, you're driving in traffic and people have road rage because everybody now else on the road is a saber tooth tiger. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> if we don't use, if we don't use our, uh, you know, our higher consciousness and our logic and our capabilities that we have now, then we, uh, yeah, we want to run people over and that's not good. Um, no, it's not good. It's not good yeah. at all. And we've all been there. Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I haven't transcended this at all. Like, I've had my, my road rage moments or my, my caveman <laughs> brain moments and, it, it, what's what's interesting is being able to like witness when you do it, like when you, you know, when you flip out and you go afterwards, go, oh, crap, I did just act like an idiot then. Yeah. Yeah. I should probably do something about that. You know, like 
ideally I would like to catch it before, but at least there's some ability to catch it after the fact. Whereas a lot of people don't even catch it then. They just live through this storytelling mind their entire right. lives and they never are aware that they're not driving the machine, that the machine is driving them. So. Yes. Yes. Well said. I like that. So day three was another one of your favorites battle beneath the surface and, um, talk about, I think it was, I'm pulling it up here. Page 17, winning the wrong battle. That's interesting. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about, um, one of the things I brought up, brought up in there was, um, I, I, as a kid, I was fighting this battle for like, to try to control my external circumstances. I think that we, we can all kind of relate to that. Like I was shy and insecure. I was beat up. I didn't feel loved and accepted for whatever reason from my, my father. And so I thought that the battle to fight was to control my external circumstances, to make myself tougher, stronger, more brave, go fight people in a cage, go fight people in a ring. And eventually if I, if I did enough fighting, then I would feel safe in my own skin in order to be happy. And fast forward, you know, 20 some years, I had a big business, a thriving martial arts school, everything that I said I, I wanted and I was still unhappy. I didn't, I didn't understand why that could even be possible. Um, come to find out the fears that I, I had growing up were still there. I still had the fear and insecurity of not being accepted and loved by my father. And that permeated into every story that I told myself about my life, including um, a failed marriage, a failed business. And the wrong fight was the external fight. Because yeah. I, can, I can win every battle outside of my life and it's still not going to change how I feel inside of myself. And until I figure out how to win that battle, then I'm never going to be free. And it's the one battle that I have control over, really. You know, I don't have any control over the external circumstances. No matter right. how many world titles I win, I, I, can't, I can't win the inside battle that way. I've got to go inside to do that. And so that's essentially what um, the chapter talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I thought that was really cool. Um, just a, and a really great um, analogy there. And you're right. I, I think that a lot of people are, are trying to win battles, and they're um, completely engaged in, in the wrong conflict. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I've been studying a lot on just like, you know, human consciousness my entire life and more and more lately because I, you know, able to see like my own scars, right. My own habits that I passed off as, as positive things. Um, you know, like even the idea of like what, what our personality is, you know, we mm -hmm. think that this personality is this sticks, that saying, but at the end of the day, our personality is just a, a bunch of stories that we've deemed to be true. Um, I had an instructor tell me once that stories are what uphold belief. And if I have enough stories piled together to make a belief system, a value system, now I have a personality, which is literally this thing that is created. Not only is it created, but it comes from my external circumstances. It comes from my experience with my parents, with the world with society. So literally the majority of who you think you are didn't even really come from you. It came from everything else. And understanding that all of these are stories anyway, stories uphold belief, but our stories may or may not actually be true. Then it started to kind of question like my own reality. And mm -hmm. the fact that like it was made up at first drove me nuts. And then I was like, oh, but if it's made up, then I can also make up another reality, too, which would also change the way I believe and the way I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I heard um, and I think it was Michael Neal. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, he's a he's a pretty renowned um, coach. Uh, and uh, I think his book is called Super Coach. But anyway, um, I believe mm. I believe it was him um, who said he refers to personal or your, your personality as your personal reality. Mm. And I was like, that is so interesting because, because, uh, yeah, I guess that, that 
it kind of leads to what you just talked about. And you're right. If it's your personal reality, well, you can change that. And if you're changing, you know, what you're perceiving and the meaning you're applying to things and, and how you are viewing and creating reality, that's going to affect how you, you know, your, your personal identity. And, uh, so your personality then could feasibly, um, you know, morph and change and be altered depending on how you choose to view or alter your personal reality. I just thought that was really mm. interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful way of putting that. And, you know, I, I, I've come, you know, I've bumped up against that in recent life because of, um, I've been known as a martial arts instructor for most of my, my career. And in the last year or so, my, 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 my identity, quote unquote, has been shifting more to being a yoga instructor and a life coach. And all of these are just like hats that we put on anyway, that we, right. we can take on and off as we want. We just, for some reason, believe these hats are like permanently glued to our head and we got to wear them every moment of our life. But, mm-hmm. but I, I bumped up against that because, you know, I was like, well, if I'm not considered a martial artist, then who am I? Who am I really? And I had to question that. I had to like dissect that and have a painstaking internal death of the old self that I was in order to like actualize this new self. But the more and more I allowed that part of me to die, the freer I became because like all of this stuff is made up anyway. Why should I be a slave to a thing that I literally created that was supposed to make me feel happy, to make me feel free? I was supposed to be a person, a personality, my own personal reality was supposed to be something that set me free, my own creation. But why am I a slave on my own creation? It was a question that I had to continue to ask myself. And then I continue to ask my, my clients like, okay, well, if this is, this is supposed to be something to make you have joy and you have power over it, then why are you letting it make you suffer? And maybe there's a better way. Yeah. 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 It, you have to come to the realization. I think it's at it, it, some point, um, about what is self-imposed. Mm. Mm. What do you mean by that? Well, um, it's, uh, it's all, like you said, you created it, which means it's self-imposed. You brought it upon mm. yourself, whatever your, you know, creation, your, your personality, your circumstances, we all bring those things upon ourselves. And so Mm. if it's self-imposed, um, if we own that, now we have the freedom to change it. If we don't own it, if we think it just is that way, because that's how I was born or that's how I was raised, or that's how society says I have to be, then we don't own it. Then we feel like we're powerless to change it. But if we mm. understand and own the things that are self-imposed that we bring upon ourselves or create ourselves, now we have the freedom, like you said, to create something new to make the change. Yeah, very well said. I like I like that uh, that approach to it. It's mm-hmm. um, it's hard in some circumstances to say that to people, especially, and you know, again, going back to some source of empathy or even like. I guess empathy might be a strong, too, too strong of a word in the sense where, or caring. Um, if someone has experienced some, some deep trauma in their life, for example, right. And that has left a, a pretty decent scar on their psychology on who they are as a person. And that mm-hmm. permeates into everything that they do. It, you know, it could be very difficult or hard for me to come in to them. And, and so many words say, well, your reality is now your choice. Mm-hmm. And yet, and yet, mm-hmm. the, even though they did not have the choice of what happened to them, the day-to-day choice of deciding whether I'm going to live into this new personality is theirs. Yes. You know, it's not your, what does Will Smith said, this is, it's not your fault, but it's damn sure your responsibility to have a life after anything that has happened to you. Exactly. And, and that's, that's hard to hear sometimes. It was hard to hear for myself. And I know it can be hard to hear if you've gone through something that's really traumatic. And I'm not saying that it's an easy decision. I'm just right. saying that it does put the power on you rather than putting the power outside of yourself. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not to diminish what may have happened. But, um, but if you're willing to 
you know, um, go through the process of, of owning where you are now and how you want to move forward, you, you can find some, a greater sense of peace and freedom than maybe what you had previously. So you're not still a victim in an old story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. To, to some small degree, we, we all, we all do it. It's just, it's just a matter of like, you know, the first, uh, we weren't going to talk about this chapter, but I talked about hitting rock bottom and letting pain push you is that, uh, that was like chapter one. And the general idea of like, sometimes you can't go to the top until you go all the way to the bottom. You know, if you're hanging around in the middle of this, everything is kind of okay. You know, good is the enemy of great type of scenario. You don't have enough discomfort to actually like launch yourself to that next level. So sometimes people have to go all the way down to the bottom, meaning like just own mm -hmm. up to it. Like life is not the way I want it to be right now. Like maybe it, maybe it actually sucks. Maybe my relationship is horrible. Maybe my finances are horrible. Maybe I am not confident and I don't like the person that I've become. Like I have to literally say those things out loud in order to go, okay, this is where you are. Okay. No problem. This is where you are. We're not going to deny where you are, but we need to know where you are in order to get where you're going to go. If you're at the bottom of a mountain and you need to climb to the top, the first thing you have to recognize is you haven't even gotten off your back yet. You're still laying on your back trying to talk about the top of the mountain and you haven't even figured out how to get to your feet. Let's address the fact that you're still laying down. Yeah. Let's address yeah. that fact. And then we'll start working our way up to our knee and then to our foot and then eventually get a hand off the ground. And now we're standing. Oh, well, maybe we can start talking about walking up that mountain yet, but until we address right. that, it's just a pipe dream. And it's just something that's going to give you more suffering because you are literally putting yourself in a place in this future that you have no idea how to get to, that you're nowhere near. It's just, it's, it's not a good place. That's positive psychology has its place. But in that area, I found that like with some people, men and women, we have to like go, okay, let's just talk about the reality of this. Where are we right now? Mm -hmm. Are you really where you want to be? How bad is it? Is it bad enough for you to change or is it just, uh, it's okay. If a person wants, like, for example, if someone's overweight and they're overweight, but they're rather having a relatively comfortable life, everything's comfortable. Everything's fine. Uh, I don't like the way I look, but, uh, the pain of going to the gym and eating right, not a big deal. If that person is literally like, I'm dying every day that I eat like this, I am, I'm dying. I'm killing myself. I don't like myself when I look in the mirror. I don't like the fact that I don't have any energy. My life feels horrible. I would love to get them to the point where they're like, well, imagine a world where you feel like you have full of energy and, and vitality and all that. I'd love to get to that point. But first, we have to address that until it sucks enough, you're too comfortable right now to change. Mm -hmm. You're too yeah. comfortable to change. So you have to make, you have to at least recognize where you are first in order for us to step forward. Yeah. Com comfort doesn't really uh, motivate anyone oh. to change. <laughs> but, rarely, but, you know, no. <laughs> and we can, and we, we human beings can, are willing to tolerate a lot of discomfort sometimes before we finally will say, I will tolerate this no more. I am making a change and I'm not doing it. I'm not waiting till New Year's. I'm doing it right now. I'm doing it yeah. like in the next 10 minutes. That's yeah. <laughs> sometimes that's what it takes. I agree. So, okay, let's hit one more before we sign off. Cause this one was kind of cool. Um, this was really interesting. I thought day 23 and you call it own your axis. And I got to tell you, your description of the tango got me actually really wanting to take tango lessons. That was very, yeah. very, uh, -huh. uh, inspiring. Firing, shall we say? But yeah, I I love the concept, and um, and it it's so applicable to all aspects of our lives. So, um, so tell me about that a little bit. So I I took up Argentine tango. Well, I guess it would have been four years ago now. Um, and you know, I, I was fortunate enough to find a very insightful and spiritual teacher in order to teach it, and. One of the concepts in tango was that, you know, your, your axis or your point, your center point is something that you own always. And you can call it your center of gravity, your center of balance, but your axis point is this, this point where you are at your whole, you're at your own center. You control your own balance forward, backward, side to side. And tango was one of those beautiful arts where two people come together chest to chest, cheek to cheek, 
and they share an access point, um, almost like a, a triangle or a TP. But one of the key components in this dance is that although we share an access point, we always maintain our own access, meaning I want to give enough forward pressure into my partner that they can feel that I'm there. But in any given moment that they were to step away from me, I can still hold myself upright and manage my own space. Mm -hmm. And in the dance, it became very uh, evident if you were doing too much of one. So if you were leaning too far into your partner, well, now your partner has to carry all of your weight. And now they can't, they can't read you as well. They have to like literally carry you around. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if you're not leaning in enough, then your partner will have a tendency to overrun you. And then there's no connection on that part. We're mm -hmm. looking for that tenuous balance between the two where we can both lean in on one another and then still hold our own ground. And I found that like the best relationships, whether they be romantic or business or what have you, mm -hmm. are the ones that are, are masterful at that balance, masterful at that point of, I am holding my own space, but we're willing to lean in to one another in order to share an access point for a moment in time in order to accomplish something greater than we could by ourselves. And at the point when you step away from me, I can hold myself upright. When we do meet, I am always sensitive to that balance between the two where I'm not going to try to overrun you and I'm not going to pull so far back that you have to overrun me, that we're both going to be in the seeking of a, of, a, of a center that we share. And as long as we're both seeking, then we're going to have a beautiful dance together. And yeah. that was a life lesson that I learned from it that was, that was beautiful for me. And I, I, I still, it still carries with me to this day. Yeah, that was just um, a fantastic um, comparison. And I, yeah, I got a lot out of that. It really made me think. And I thought, First of all, you know, um, I got a hot flash and then I was like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, uh, bucket list, tango lessons, stat. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but, um, but seriously, yes, the metaphor and how that applies to your life and, and in particular, your relationships, especially your, your more intimate, you know, relationships. It was, it's really, really a great analogy. And, um, and I thought that was just brilliant. So bravo. That was, uh, that was awesome. Thank so, you. You'll, you'll enjoy tango, by the way, you'll enjoy it. I, I talk about hot flashes. I remember <laughs> my, my, my teacher used to say like after a good, like, um, dance with a good partner, and it doesn't matter whether you're married to the person or not. You're dancing with someone that you have a good connection with. Yeah. It feels like it literally feels like you need to go take a cigarette, have a cigarette break. I knew and, you were uh, going to say that. <laughs> oh, my God. And it's the truth. I'm telling you, it's the truth. So <laughs> the fun. That's cool. Yeah, I kind of wanted a cigarette. I don't even smoke. <laughs> That's right. Me either. But I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> oh, too funny. I totally funny. get it. That's awesome. Well, as much as I would love to go through every single lesson, I think um, I think we've given though our, our listeners a really good taste of what's in this book, and um, and I I wish you great success with it. I'm sure you're getting awesome feedback already. Yeah, I appreciate and, it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I really appreciate you having me on. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy you could come back and, uh, and share this. So, uh, everyone, I hope that you will, uh, you'll pick up, uh, well, it's a digital, right? They can just download it. Correct. So I'm giving free copies of the book. Um, I, I'll mail you actually a physical copy of the book for free. All you have to do is pay for shipping. Um, and I can give you the link for that for the, for the show notes. It should be buck grant, buck grant coaching.com slash free book. And you get a free book, it gets, it'll get sent out to you. Um, you'll also get a digital copy of it as well. Nice, nice. Okay, yeah. so is that the best place to find you then? It's, um, it's buckgrant.com forward slash free book? You can go buckgrant.com or you can go buckgrantcoaching.com um, backslash free book. Okay, okay. Yeah. It, is uh, there a... Uh, Excellent. Excellent. Anywhere else that um, our shifters can find you if they're looking for you? What about uh, what are your social media platforms? Absolutely. I'm on Instagram as Buck Grant and you can go to Buck Grant Coaching on Facebook as well. 
Wonderful. Yeah. And do check it out, you guys. Um, Buck does a lot of great, um, great lives and always has wonderful insights to share. So make sure you yeah. look for him. So at, daily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're you are out there. I, I need to take a lesson from you. <laughs> but no, uh, I, I just want to share. I want to share what I know. If, 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 if I can say something for a couple of minutes that is of value to people, and it helps, then, then it makes my day to know that I'm helping someone. So I'd love, if coming to my page, it's all free information. I'd love to share what I know. Good. Perfect. Nicely done. Buck, you have been awesome once again. Thank you so much. And uh, everyone, go uh, go get your copy. You will not regret it. A lot of great lessons. And I am so serious. I am signing up for Tango Lessons. As soon as I can live someplace where they offer Tango Lessons, because here in Cody, Wyoming, um, I think if there's anything happening, it's probably like old fashioned square dancing, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so I may have to put that one on the to-do list. Um, but anyway, you guys, there is a lot of value in the 28 days of lessons that Buck shares in the warrior code that anybody can benefit from. It's not just for men. And these lessons I think can really help all of us become more mindful and more focused and even more humble when necessary. Implementing and practicing the lessons is like, it's like training to strengthen the mind, the body, and the soul. And it could definitely change the way that you live your life for the better. So I hope that you love what you heard today. And uh, hey, if you haven't already, please subscribe, give me a rating, and do share your thoughts with me because I really do welcome your comments. If you are trying to make some shift happen in your life and you are interested to find out what private coaching with me is all about, you can connect with me on all social media platforms as well as we're talking shift.com or Lori Bischoff.com. That's L O R E E B I S C H O F F.com. So thank you for listening, everybody. Until we talk again next week, stay feisty, my friends, and go make some shift happen. You too, Mr. Gary V. The preceding podcast was a TJ DeSantis production. Comments, questions, and inquiries can be directed to desantisprod at gmail.com.